is a master musician, a musician, a songwriter, a ranger, a sound engineer, a consummate artist. He is the man behind the music. In fact, he is the music. Mr. Stefan Oberhoff. Hello, Stefan. <laughs> Hi, David. Can I have this in print, please? I would like to put it up on my website. Okay. <laughs> I'll type it out. <laughs> How are you? I am doing really, really good. I'm just uh, just setting, settling into the studio here in the morning at 1030 in LA, uh, Pasadena, and uh, feeling pretty good. Need some caffeine, but I quit coffee. I only can get it in the form of chocolate, which has consequences. Uh, yeah, no, I know what you mean. I've been drinking like green tea. Oh, yeah. I love that little humble little mug you got there. Oh, isn't it great? <laughs> it's so wonderful. Bucket size. I know, right? It's oh. bigger than I am. What does it say on it? Shoot for the moon. Even if you miss, you'll land among the stars. I love that. I heard that probably about 20 or 30 years ago. And that's a philosophy. Boy, like that, that aligns right with where I am. Yeah. Well, it really does because I was looking, I mean, I, I've known you for several years now, but I really looked at your website and you're so, you know, I was going to say from the heart, but you're from the soul. I, all your music, I mean, my, my, I mean, even your new album, I, I'm looking at all the applauding the sunset. Isn't that your new album? That's the new album. That's right. Oh. I mean, just the title of all your work is just, mm. Do you know uh, where that title came from, by the way, Applauding the Sunset? No, what, where? Um, now, that is a Brazilian music album, everybody. Um, and thank you for, for uh, shouting out at that because that was a labor of love that took me more than five years to put together because I had to do this while I was working with other clients. Right. Uh, but um, I, ha I happened to have spent a... Uh, sabbatical in Rio de Janeiro and I just literally left my house I lived in Woodland Hills at the time got burnt out on all the producing I was doing 10 to 12 hour days and it burnt me out so bad that the only thing I could do is grab a keyboard a laptop and some clothes and live in an apartment in Rio de Janeiro in Ipanema where that uh, the proverbial girl from Ipanema comes from <laughs> yeah. actually still shows up every now and it's actually a true living person uh, the girl really? from Ipanema. yes her name is Eloise Pinheiro uh, which means pine tree, Louise Pine Tree, Eloise Pinheiro. She's got four kids and she's, uh, she was a model and her daughter is a model and she's still alive and still walking around and coming back to that old neighborhood. And, and I lived right in the street where the music shop was, where she used to go to. And, um, but anyways, when I lived in Rio de Janeiro, I would frequently go to the beach because that's where all the pretty people are. Yeah. I mean, that's where they amass, you know, by the life post. It's called Porto Novi. It means life post number nine. Nipanema. Anyways, uh, so I decided to sit there at sunset when the beach really quiets down. Yeah. And I noticed some a sound coming up all of a sudden around about, it was about six to seven, between 6.30 and seven o'clock, this sound of applause. I thought, people are clapping. Is there somebody juggling or performing? What's going on here? But it was literally people were looking out at the, at the corner of Ipanema where they could see the sunset. And, and they would just, as the sun would kiss the water, this beautiful applause came down and it kind of would waft up and down the beach for about 10 to 15 minutes. And I'm going like, wait a minute, wait a minute, what's going on here? This is a completely, why would somebody applaud the sunset? And then it dawned on me, it's because they appreciate where they are, they appreciate the here and now and the beauty that surrounds them. And I give applause, applause to the sunset. And in that moment, I mean, I had arrived months before, but some part of my soul just, just settled down. And that was why I thought, I'm going to have to document it. That's a, a, a 10 minute lifespan in my life that has to be documented yeah. in some way, shape or form. Because in our busy lives here in the US, frequently we don't get the time to stop and just really just appreciate the texture of the moment. Yeah. You know, that's where that title comes from. Wow. When, uh, two things on that. I will never, whenever I hear that song now, Girl from Ipanipa, I, uh, I will always think of your story now. <laughs> so it has now shifted. But it's so true. I mean, two of my favorite songs, my favorite sound is in the morning when I can hear the birds singing. Yes. Um, and lately, one of my favorite sounds is at eight o'clock at night 
when people start blowing their horns and clapping for all the the health workers and oh my god yes uh just because it's you know so so you know from the heart um but you know, when did you, well what david these are all that, that's interesting that you're you're remarking on this when you wake up in the morning and the birds you hear the birds and you get at peace with that moment that's a community with you and and your world around you especially the nature and all living beings in it you know that's a form of community and then when people applaud the 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 first responders and and care workers that's a form of community say so like we can't get together physically but we're honking our horns and we're applauding in order to know that we are connected we want to be connected we want to feel connected yeah yeah when did you feel like you became connected in your life i think you know honestly i think um Coming, becoming connected is, is a, is a multi-step process. My first sense of belonging and belonging in, uh, in being in a comfort zone was for me being at my piano in the room just by myself. For some reason, you know, I grew up in a, in a, in a household of, uh, you know, relative high intensity. Uh, my father was a school teacher and very absent. You know, there was a lot of reasons for me to be, to choose a place where I could be at peace. And that was my room. And uh, I was at the piano constantly tinkling, tinkling because I was always, when I was just moving chords up and down without the purpose of learning something, without the purpose of being brilliant or achieving anything, um, I just felt at peace. And, you know, the music is almost like, for me, was like oil in the engine. If the engine has no oil in it, you know what happens, you know? Yeah. So it, that was kind of, it let me breathe and be in the world you know, as, as, as withdrawn I was. And the other form of connection is when I turned 16. Um, no, sorry, I was 15 when I signed up for a talent contest. It was called Show 74, and it was in Solingen, Germany. I lived in Germany at the time. Yeah. And I lived there until I came to the U.S. at uh, age 31. Um, and I took part in this, uh, in the sh what they call the shootout. You know, when you do the audition, um, which you're very familiar with, uh, when I did the audition, I had played this song from uh, an artist called Lobo from Canada. And I had an old song called Baby, I'd Love You to Want Me. And then, Baby, mm, mm, I love you to want me. Uh, uh, right? And that was just a, just a lovely, beautiful, just to me, that was the American sound, although the guy was Canadian. Uh, but it was this beautiful ballad, and I had learned it, and I played it for the audition. Uh, people on a tape sent it to them and said, yeah, come on to the to the band audition, you're gonna play with a band. And I'd never played with a drummer and a bass player ever before. Yeah. Yeah. Only without a metronome, never used a metronome. So I was just playing my Elton John rock and roll ditties. So I had fairly decent rhythm, but I never played with uh, other musicians before. And now I'm sitting there 15 years old and these grown musicians, long hair bass player dude, which I am now too. So <laughs> yeah. Long hair I'm bass. getting there <laughs> <laughs> with well, this yeah. pandemic. <laughs> at this at this rate, I'm going to grow a mullet very soon. <laughs> but anyway, so the the you know they knew the song. They had obviously listened to the tape. You know, somebody had made charts. I didn't even know. I I never learned really to read or write. You know, I'm barely functioning in terms of reading charts even now. Like it's a, still a big challenge and a, and a drawback. But be it as it may, um, so I'm sitting out. These guys count off. The drummer goes click, 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 and I'm starting to play. And it is like freaking magic. It felt like a magic carpet. These guys locked with me and stayed with me. And I didn't know like that that was even possible. Right. You know, that somebody could, you know, when the rhythm locks, it's not like, you know, the lounge band playing kind of, oh, kind of, I'm, I'm, I'm waiting for my drink in the break. No, these guys were committed musicians. And it was absolute magic. Absolute magic. Talking about being connected, you know, to me, when people drum together in a drum circle or so, that is such a molecular connection that goes deeper than any therapy, goes deeper than any, any um, group event. You know, the drumming, the, the rhythm, there's a community in rhythm also. Well, what's so good about what you're, you do, you don't need to go to meditation classes because you live meditation yeah. in the way. I wish that were true. I, I'm really high strung, you know, because when I sit in the computer, like, you know, I get that, the focus is like, you know, other people do cocaine. Like to me, <laughs> I, can, I connect with, with music so intensely, you know? Yeah, sugar for me, but I'm, I'm doing better for that. 
you know. Yes. No, I'm so I'm so glad that uh, Rosalind. I met you uh, with Rosalind Kind, and I mean you're working with her on projects. You have projects with Jason Gould, That's um, right. and you've worked with Quincy Jones. Yep, that wasn't a that was an adventure. It was amazing. But, I you know what? Yeah. Here's an interesting thing. Um, I just. You know, sometimes some of my friends say, boy, you must you, you, you must have been kind of courageous, you know, just leaving your country of birth and showing up in another country just to study and then then to, to thrive. I thought, you know, I never felt that that was courage at all. It felt like I had this drive. You know, I heard, you know, Ella Fitzgerald and um, the great Ellis Larkins, a piano player that not many people know, who is one of the most beautiful accompanists of all times. Uh, on a record called Ella Sings Gershwin and the, the Beautiful Ballads. I have Just, that. You have that album. I think I have the actual album. Oh my God, you have the vinyl. Oh God. This. Well, I know what to get you for your birthday. <laughs> oh yes. Oh my God. The um, I have to get a vinyl player because you know there's something in the sound that is in the analog sound that we still can't reproduce it with all the advanced digital means now. But and you know what? And I I have like over 500 albums. I can't get rid of them. I don't know why. Yeah. I'm just like you know. Sorry. I know, <laughs> but but you know that album you know that you are that we both love, um, just 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 something blossomed blossomed open inside of me and that was just two musicians you know and then on that same, same album i believe the one of the the record company's decisions that i don't understand and still love to this day is that at the very end of the album uh they put a super up-tempo big band version of lady be good in there that might have been you know they might have packaged it twice because there's just the ballads right. you know with uh with Ellis on the piano and Ellis singing and there is this other version that that Melissa talks about um Melissa uh, Manchester that, right exactly with whom I've been touring for so long and I'm so fortunate to learn from her Amazing. but but the the truly truly um but that the, the drive the, the the boundless joy the width of the chords I thought you know these Americans write chords like the Grand Canyon. I'm going to have to just be there. And when the, when the opportunity came to show up here in 1990 for a, what I call a scratch and sniff course, remember those scratch and sniff? Oh, Take yeah. a sample of your, your, your car freshener. Um, I came out here and I, it was clear to me I had to be here. There was just no way to return back to Germany because Germany is always following the trend of other countries to a large degree. And this is one of the places of creation. And for somebody, if you're a, fashion designer, where would you go? You'd go right. to Milan, New York, right. Uh, Paris, right? Yeah, yeah. So for the music, you know, just I definitely landed in the right coast. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Um, anyway, so the, we, you, we were talking about, about Quincy. Back then, so I didn't think it was courageous at all. It felt just I had a hunger. And given how relatively shy I am, believe it or not, um, around, especially when, when I meet new people for the first time, um, f you know, that means like, I'm, you know, I wouldn't call it fear, but like, you know, like a, like a shyness. I, I still have that today. But, um, but if you would have told me when I set sail here for this country in 1991, that almost 19 years later, I'd be spending two years in the studio with the grand master of all soulful things, Quincy Jones, I would have, I would have said, you're ready for the mental institutions, my friend. Oh my God. Well, how did that manifest? Uh, you mean how it came about or how it, how it played out? Uh, yeah, how, uh, both. Okay, good. <laughs> Briefly, I've been working with a very gifted song, singer, song, uh, songwriter mostly, um, well, also singer, songwriter, uh, Marsha Malamut. Ah, uh, yes, love Marsha. Yeah, Marsha, you know, who wrote Lessons to be Learned by, you know, sung by Barbara Streisand and so many other artists, uh, uh, Diana Ross and so forth. Uh, Marsha became a client of mine when I was doing mostly demo recordings in, uh, in, in, back in Glendale before I moved to Woodland Hills and really took off. And Burt Bacharach became my client. But um, Marsha had met Jason Gould in a, a, a spiritual seminar somewhere. Mm -hmm. And um, he said he just came back from New York, moved back to the West Coast. Um, also, probably be, be, to be easier connecting to connect with his mom, you know, who's also out here, of course. And be it as it may, uh, he said, you know, I thought about maybe 
uh, setting foot in the studio, really see if I can, you know, you know, just what happens when I go to the studio. And Marsha said, well, there's one guy that I work with and that happened to be me. So that's how that came about. So I owe a great debt of gratitude to Marsha that she introduced us. And we hit it running. I mean, just we hit the ground running from the first moment on. And song after song got released and EP got released. And on Barbara's birthday, yeah. Jason had proceeded to play a recording of Nature Boy. So if you go, go to YouTube and you find Nature Boy. Well, I have to say, I heard that I went to the, the bowl to, when Barbara did her concert. Yes. And they played that. And I was transfixed. I mean, it's, that is one of the best versions of that song. It's sexy. It's serene. You know, and I was thinking about it this morning, too, when I was listening to it this morning. It, it sort of expands your brain. Oh, it that's takes, beautiful. takes you on a ride for, to so many levels. I mean, it's, it's really a beautiful version. Oh, I'm so glad that you think that way. I think that was probably the sixth or seventh song that Jason and I had worked on. Right. And um, Jason had made this lovely video, which you saw at the Hollywood Bowl, which comprised, you know, pictures of him and his mom when he was just a baby. Beautiful. Then, you know, just a toddler and then, you know, so all the way into adulthood until he was in his 30s. And they had, to, had another photo op together and just beautiful. And you see their progress together, you know, his mother and son. And then he just finished the video off. She's like, I love you, mom, forever, you know, at the end of the song. And uh, that was performed at Barbara's birthday at her house in Malibu um, in front of about 100 people with a good sound system. And, and Barbara was deeply impressed. And an older gentleman, a black gentleman, got up uh, and walked over to Jason, stuck his hand in his chest, and said, we're going to make a record together. And that happened to be Quincy Jones. Quincy. Oh, my and God. It, what yeah, a birthday present. Yeah, to tell me about it. Exactly. And uh, then later on, uh, Jason took a meeting with Quincy. And uh, Quincy said, you know, I really like your musical choices, too. And I love your voice. And uh, Jason, who is so humble and so open, said to uh, Quincy, he said, you know, well, that's, uh, that's just one guy in all these instruments, except maybe the lead saxophone in Nature Boy. That's just one guy. That's this German dude. And uh, uh, that happened to be me. And Quincy said, well, I'll bring him. You know, so I'm walking into Quincy Jones' house. And, you know, I, I don't easily get, I kind of hold it close to my chest. Right. But on the way home, I just couldn't, couldn't stop blabbering about, you know, how amazing it was to meet Quincy and how nice he was. Yeah, you know, how kind and how you know he likes to fist bump and high five and it's just it it was a freaking dream come true. Wow. Yeah. Wow. You know, I I I think of I pictured Quincy's face and then it took me to somehow it just now took me to my father's face because he has such a such a kind loving face that has so much depth to it and it then took me to your other album that I was listening to today about father. What, I'm trying to find the title of that. Yeah, Conversations with My Father. And I listened to that this morning. And it really affected me because my father loved jazz and he loved Ella Fitzgerald and he loved all that. And I heard it and it, it reminded me of the music that he listened to. So it was sort of like a message through your music from my dad. Oh, that's beautiful, brother. Thank you. That, that, that means a lot to me, David. It means a lot to me. Uh, this song, actually that whole collection of songs were on my plate and partly after my dad's passing. My dad passed very early. He was just turned 70 uh, and he just uh, succumbed to uh, pancreatic cancer. And since he and I weren't very close yeah. in our lifetimes, you know, I've felt like maybe I can have a musical conversation with him now. Yeah. And uh, the title cut, Conversations with My Father, uh, is just this ballad between acoustic guitar and, uh, and James, uh, played by James Hera, who I toured with, with uh, for years with Brenda Russell, who's later on played with Huey Lewis um, before Louis uh, had to stop touring. Yeah. Uh, Huey had to stop touring. Uh, but this conversation is the imagined soul conversation that I always wanted to have with my dad because he was not an easy guy to get close to. Wow. And, um, Early on, when I started getting deeper into social media, I posted this on, uh, on a Facebook post. And a friend of mine, uh, who's really a marketing genius, uh, my good friend Jimmy Dunn, who has a company called In Inspire Entertainment, said to me, Stefan, don't ever post anything on 
social media that doesn't contain a gift. Uh, on some level, a gift, uh, let's say, it could be a spiritual gift, you know, it could be a musical gift, but, but an, or an insight or a joke or something that, you know, gives a twist to people's lives in a positive way. Yeah. So just don't post anything without a gift. So I decided to um, make a post with that, uh, with the song back then, you could still easy, easily post sound files inside of SoundCloud, in Facebook, which you can't anymore. That's why I believe nowadays it's all about having visuals with your songs so you can post them on social media um, because it's a much better vehicle. Um, I posted the song and I said, you know, and I told us the truthful story of my dad, you know, and that, that I wanted to just have this conversation in a musical way, connecting soul to soul, so to speak. And um, after he had passed. And so I posted it and uh, a whole bunch of people responded to it. But here's one thing, mm. a zillion woman maybe in her mid thirties answered. And she said, Stefan, I uh, thank you for posting your song. Um, I had always been angry at my dad because he died. And he, I always, he just felt he left us, but he died when he was very young. He was about 38 or so. And, uh, and left me to raise my sister and my brother. I was the oldest. So I was always, I harbored this deep anger at him, you know, for, for decades. And, 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 he, and she said, um, and today, as I listened to your music, the wistful memory of him returned and I cried. And uh, I just sat there and sobbed. I'm going like, wow, you know, you, you, w this woman gave me such a profound gift back to, to that that music would facilitate some healing. Yeah. You know, it was, it was, it's possible, you know, it's possible that we can underscore people's mo emotion and what they're going through in the moment. That's the highest, I think the highest good that music can do. Well, music is so healing. Yes. And especially especially through yours. I mean, was I, 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 I just read this off your, just took a few lines from your website about um, applauding the sunset. And in that moment, in these five seconds of bliss, I knew what it meant to be here. The busy sound of the city behind us faded out, allowing me to completely present and free from all worry and wishing. It was the sound of gratitude, of God's magical work, needing nothing else on top of this sensation, smelling and sensing more, breathing deeper and free, like when you, we were children. Yes. Beautiful. Ah, oh, thank you. Thank you. It's so nice that somebody reads it. <laughs> it oh my it. God. <laughs> Again, I was just like sucked in by this. It's like, oh my God, I gotta like work with it, this man. <laughs> <laughs> One of these days. I'd, I'd be honored, my friend. Oh, my God. Me. Um, what if, I mean, I oh got there's so much. What If you were, to, we're talking to students, for a student who's just beginning or they want to get out there and create, what, what, what would you suggest? To a whole bunch of things. To give yourself permission to throw anything against the wall, anything on tape, and to pursue it till you can't pursue it no further. Then take a break, maybe return to it a couple of weeks later and see, oh, now I have a new impulse. That's how Jason and I, and I have worked a lot with a lot of the arrangements. They would rest for weeks sometimes. Um, that is, by the way, uh, Melissa, for example, Melissa Manchester says, once you are on that trajectory of that developing song, when you write the song, just pursue it because it might evaporate as quickly as it comes. And that is certainly true for the song itself, but for the production, because the way we make music now in our home studios and our computers, mm -hmm. we can get these full sounding music tracks. So if what you do is musical or even maybe music mi mixed with video, it's okay to take a break, mm -hmm. you know? The only thing I would say, be careful. If you find yourself doing six second, 15 second snippets and then abandoning them for years, uh. that's what I used to do. And then I found it was very difficult to retrace my steps to ever pick up the energy that they contain, you know? So uh, I would say, allow yourself to try anything. And um, there, uh, wait. 
there is a website. It's it's a, all about Groove. Wait a minute. It is called my uh, one of my clients, my dear Michelle Brarman, with whom I've been producing these Land Before Time and the Curious George videos and so many other productions and be performing live. Uh, her son is a drummer. He's with an 8-bit computer band called Anamanaguchi. Now, these kids are supremely successful. Their following on social media is out of this world. I want to say that there must be close to a million followers on social networks. Wow. They do shows that are comprised of video projection screens behind them. There are three-dimensional projection cubes hanging from the ceiling. They have lightsabers like in Star Wars. And they give all of that away. They show people how it's done. They give them, the, hold the saber here, just hold it. They give it to their fans backstage. And, and they, they're incredibly open about that process. And they play this stuff with tracks and, and with videos synchronized to the music. And uh, uh, Luke, the drummer, Luke Silas, uh, the drummer, turned me on to this, to this website. And now I'm trying to remember what it's called. Yeah. Because of this isolation that I'm, I'm getting very free. No, I, I get the same way. Um, some of the music that has been posted there, you know, you can basically download their sounds. And there's many websites like that. It's called Splice. Splice. S-P-L-I-C-E. Okay. And if you listen to the music that's posted there, I'm going to, this is just downright bizarre. It's like a film score on acid or something like that. <laughs> Right. And, and, but, you know, these kids gave themselves permission to post it. And that inspires me to give myself permission. So we listen to other people's things because we can distill a permission. Oh, this can be done. How cool. Right. Example, there was a young woman came out. Her name is Emma Jane Heap. Um, and she used a vocoder. I love her. Yeah. yeah. You know, the tight, dense vocoder sound has always impressed me. And it impressed this young genius called Jacob Collier who, uh, um, you know, was, is, is still very young. I think he's not even 30 yet. And they call him the new Mozart. But he said, I heard Imogene Heap, and I started working with, uh, with vocoders from now on forward. So, so in other words, coming back to these young artists that we're talking about, so if you f just listen to the breadth of what's possible and, and I'll give that, have that give you permission or start something from scratch, even if it's just sounds, yeah. you know. So that's that's one thing that I could think of. And see where it takes you. Just see where it takes you. In the moment. And that's why what you mentioned before, you don't want to let it sit too much because when you come back to it, you're in a different moment. So it yeah. might not match up or uh, Yes, exactly. It it could be sometimes it's you know, it's a difference between having things on the workbench or filed away. Hmm. Filed away means there your energy is no longer connected with it. You know, you might hear it like literally 12 years from now and you go like, why did I not pursue this? Mm. You know, it's, there's a certain stick to itiveness that you have to have. And when you get impatient, okay, just get up, you know, just either have a cup of coffee or, or, or t do something completely different. But then, you know, just throw it on your iPhone, throw it on, on Dropbox or any application, just let it play while you do the dishes. That is, by the way, one thing I found out. I did my best mix decisions when I had a studio that was associated, that was attached to the house. I could literally open the door and play the mix in loop mode. And then I would literally drop the dishes, hopefully not too hard, <laughs> yeah. run back into the studio and we're like, oh, and now I can hear it. That one syllable over in the lead vocal it pokes out at the end of the song. So let me bring that down and then I would just go do my dishes and, until I get another impulse. So it is, it's very interesting what the autistic brain that's, uh, that we all have, if we let that work for us, rather than stick in our nose and, and think that's how, where the solution has to come from. And that's not always true. Wow. Well, that, it gives me trust to, trust to take that breath and not rush with it. Just be where you are with it. Right. And then when it happens, yes, boom, 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 go down. Exactly. It, it, it's a really interesting thing, you know. Um, the other thing is also, like, if you're a young artist, you have a tremendous advantage over me, for example. I just turned 60, and I grew up without a computer. Well, yeah, uh, listen, we're in the same age range. <laughs> well, you know, then, David, you also grew up without a computer, right? When did you uh, uh, have your first computer? 
Well, I didn't have my, I learned computer in high school, I, it, right toward the end of it. But I didn't get my computer, I'd say, until college, maybe. So then you're old, how old you're? I am 56. Okay, and college, and you look fantastic. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so and, do you, my friend. Thank you, brother. Uh, the, so, but, so you, then when you had your computer, or maybe just about 20 or 19? Pro probably, probably. Um, yes, because I did, uh, I, I would say about 20, because I started taking comp uh, other computer classes in um, uh, uh, junior college. Right. Um, well, the, it's interesting because you were literally tw uh, 11 years ahead of me. It was 31. I was working at Roland Musical Instruments back in Germany still in Hamburg. Yeah. Um, and they had a black and white Atari there with four megabytes of memory and a floppy disk. And that's how, when I learned to sequence for the first time. And that's when this whole world opened up and I could layer tracks upon tracks upon tracks. I mean, I tell you, like, you know, for a kid like me who was just like more comfortable being at home, you know, I had a few friends down in my village where I grew up in a tiny little village, not, clo not far from Cologne, Germany. Uh, but I was very much more comfortable to be by myself and, uh, and then just do multi-tracks with cassette recorders and the whole nine yards. Yeah. So if, if, you, if you don't have a life like I choose not to, chose not to have back then, uh, then you can, you can just be the orchestra. Yeah. And if you look at Jacob Collier now, who uh, not too long ago got signed by Quincy Jones, because when Quincy heard his vocal stacks and the harmony and the soulfulness, he said, I want to meet him. And they, you know, they asked Jacob to come over from England and he got signed on the spot. Wow. Yeah. And it's, and he did everything himself and he posted it on YouTube and on YouTube became his, basically his record promotion vehicle because Quincy's young team had heard them and said, Quincy, you should check out Jacob. He's, he's amazing. Yeah. And he said, well, just lay something on, play something for me. And, and he listened to it. He's going like, he's shaking his head and going like, I want to meet this kid. Yeah. He said another word before that, but, uh, but he, you know, and then Jacob flies over and gets a call from Quincy Jones' office and said, Quincy would like to meet you. Would you like to come? And Jacob says, yeah, um, um, I guess so, you know. Right. It's, it, this is a medium. We didn't have any of this available. So if you're now on social media, almost anything you need to learn can be found, multiply addressed and beautifully addressed in social media. Yeah. How many instruments do you play? Thanks for asking. Um, at one point, I was playing something like eight instruments. I even had picked up trumpet and accordion, wow. but I had to drop more and more off as I got professionally uh, involved in, in music production. Um, I play uh, a proficient level um, uh, keyboards. I mean, all keyboards and synthesizers and piano, uh, guitar, elect electric and acoustic. I play bass, a proficient enough. Um, I do drums but I do drums in a way that most of the kids nowadays know. I'm doing it on a keyboard. I'll give you a little example if I may. Let's see here.
Thank you.